want you to turn in your Bibles to First Corinthians five, uh, Second Corinthians five. As you turn there, I'm going to pray, ask the Lord to bless our time as we look at His Word this morning. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we are once again gathered this morning to exalt the Son. And we say those words, and I pray that you would help us to see why He is so highly lifted up. Help us this morning to see why our joy, our worship, our evangelism, our affections are all stirred because of what Christ has done in the way He saved us by giving us a righteousness not our own. Oh Father, help us to go down deep into the well of Your Word as we plumb the depths of the price that You paid for our great salvation. Help me, Lord, to be clear to Your people that they would be built up, not torn down. That they would be encouraged and not discouraged. That they would be bold for You that they would walk away from this place filled with joy. Joy that is unceasing as they are anchored to the Savior. And in His name we pray. Amen. I distinctly remember when my fifth grade teacher rushed us all out of the classroom in the middle of the day. Other teachers were clearly excited almost in a frantic state. My teacher had all us walk in a line to evacuate the building, and upon exiting our classrooms, we were all given these special glasses to put on and told to look up at the sun. It was the first time I had ever seen a solar eclipse. Now, growing up in Saudi Arabia, this was a very weird moment because the days were always sunny. It was rarely ever partly cloudy and rarely did it ever rain. Most of the months it was clear. So to see the glow of the sun encumbered was very odd. The playground looked different. The colors of my world were very different. Instead of the vibrant colors, I saw dark and grayish hues of light shadow and the sun was being swallowed up by the moon. I fear the same is true today where we have eclipsed the glory of Christ as we have erected lesser gods, lesser powers, and lesser majesties to His wonderful aura. Therefore, we have lost the brightness of our joy as our life looks tepid and absent of Christ's glory. And even as Christians, we are pilgrims in this place walking in this fallen world, and we can lose sight of His glory and therefore lose our joy. What is it that will cause our hearts to be inflamed again? What is it that will cause our joy to be once to be bright again? I believe that we need to be reminded of the great doctrine of justification by, the, by grace through faith alone, by the imputed righteousness of Christ alone. In the history of the church, nothing has been so fiercely debated as the doctrine of justification by faith. In the early centuries, there were debates regarding the the Trinity, regarding the essence of God and the persons of God. Then there were the debates regarding the person of Christ and the two natures of Christ in the 4th and 5th centuries. But nothing was so revolutionary as the debate regarding the grounds by which we will be declared just before God. And so I want, us take, I want to take us to the very heart of the Gospel. I propose to you this morning that the Christian's joyful worship is deeply rooted in their understanding of justification by faith alone. The Bible teaches that justification is a legal declaration that a man is no longer under the curse of the law, but stands righteous before the bar of God. And so to help us understand this doctrine, I want to zero in on the very heart of justification. 
I want to take us to the epicenter of that firestorm that led to the Reformation in the 16th century when they asked this one very simple question. And the question was, on what grounds am I ever just? On what grounds am I ever declared righteous before a holy God? The psalmist asked, if you, O Lord, should mark our iniquities, who could stand? The question of justification is, how can an unjust, unrighteous sinner be justified before a holy, just, and righteous God? And so of all the texts that I could have chosen, this is the one that I believe most succinctly and clearly explains on what basis our justification rests upon. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Let me read that to you as I take a sip. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This passage stands out in all of Paul's epistles as the most succinct explanation of how a person is justified before God. The entire gospel message is found in that verse. That verse touches on multiple strains of theology. It touches on soteriology, how a person is saved. It touches on Christology, about the work of Christ. It touches on theology proper in identifying the Father who gives over the Son. Salvifically, it explains how the justice of God is upheld. Prophetically, it explains how the, the, the justice of God was prophesied in the Old Testament, and how the justice of God is both upheld and at the same time the sinner is declared righteous. However, this passage does have a context. Earlier, Paul has been arguing that the, most, that the world must be reconciled to God through Christ. Look in verse 18. He says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Here, the goal of the apostle is really He's being evangelistic. He was to share the gospel to all the creatures and plead with them to be reconciled to God. You see, people have a problem. And the problem that people have is not sin. That's not their greatest problem. Their greatest problem is God. That they're not reconciled to God. Sin has severed that relationship with God. Sin has severed and broken that relationship with God. And so the question then is, how can I be restored back to God when sin is in the way? How does God reconcile sinners to Himself? Does God just sweep sin under the rug and says, it never happened? Does God just look away and say, all is forgiven, you're entering into the kingdom? How can it be that a just and holy God could declare a sinner reconciled and allowed entrance into His kingdom? The answer, the answer to that question is found in this verse. And here we see the, re- that reconci- the reconciliation that is necessary. And to help us, we need to hang our thoughts on really three main points. Three headings that we're going to be looking at. The first is the purity of Christ. We want to see the purity of Christ. Then we're going to look at the, the substitution by Christ. And then we're going to look at our justification in Christ. So really three headings in this one verse. Let's look at first the purity of Christ. The purity of Christ. The passage begins by saying, He made Him who knew no sin. And really, that's in the front there. that The one that's being identified knows no sin. And there's two pronouns. I need to identify who they are. The He that refers to in verse 21 in the front, that's really God the Father. Going back to verse 20. The Father, when it's mentioned, when God is mentioned with Christ in verse 20, it's often referring to God the Father. Let us be reconciled to God, implying the Father is the one that we need to be reconciled through, with. And it's through the Son. And then the one who, the Him is referring to Christ. So it really would be read this way. The Father made Christ who knew no sin. Is how we would understand those pronouns. And I want to focus on that last phrase, that Christ, Him who knew no sin. Paul is very upfront about the sinlessness of Christ because the very next verse says something that is staggering. It's the most 
unbelievable verse that God could ever say. That the one who knew no sin would be sin on our behalf. But before we get to the part where he explains that he is sin, we need to understand what does it mean that Jesus did not know sin. In what sense did Jesus not know sin? This is not saying that Jesus was ignorant about the nature of sin or the effects of sin or the punishment that is required because of sin. Clearly, he would tell sinners like the adulterous woman and say to her, sin no more. Jesus fully knew what sin was about. But instead, what Paul is saying is that Jesus was pure. He never knew sin as a sinner. Because he never committed any sin that would help him experience the guilt of sin and experience the effects of sin and broken relationships because of sin. That Jesus never knew. We feel the guilt of sin. We feel the brokenness of sin by our actions. Jesus, however, never felt the guilt of sin because He Himself never performed or committed any sin. Jesus was pure, undefiled. And that is the testimony of unbelievers. That is the testimony of the apostles. That is the testimony of God Himself that Jesus is pure. Take, for example, the unbeliever Pontius Pilate who said, I find no guilt in this man, in Luke 23, verse 4. Or think of the unbelieving but yet repentant thief on the cross who said, this man has done nothing wrong. Or the Roman centurion who said, certainly, this man was innocent. Or take the apostles, like Peter who said that Jesus was holy and the righteous one, in Acts 3, verse 14. Or the apostle John who said, in him there is no sin, 1 John 3, 5. Or whoever the author of Hebrews was who said this, one who was tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. And then lastly, by God Himself who said on multiple occasions, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus was clearly without sin, but yet it's explaining that He knew no sin. And so this raises some questions. If Jesus didn't know sin, if Jesus didn't commit any sins, the question many unbelievers, or maybe some of you might be thinking, well, is this. Well, is it possible for Jesus to have sinned while on the earth? Is it possible? Could He have sinned while on the earth? Could He have sinned? Was it possible for Him to have committed or experienced any sin while He was living in the 33 years of His life? And the reason they ask that question It's an important question because the question goes like this. If Jesus could not have sinned, then were the temptations ever real? When he was tempted, were they ever real? Were they real temptations if he couldn't sin or were they just fake temptations? Now, all Christians obviously hold that Jesus did not sin. But the question is, is it possible? Jesus to sin. Now, if by possible you mean that Jesus had the human capacity to discern temptation, have a mind to, 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 be, to see the offer of temptation, of course. He has a mind like we do. He clearly understood temptation. He clearly understood sin in that way. Because he's made like us in every way. But historically, the question of does Je- is it possible for Jesus to sin, really, in centuries past, that wasn't the question. The question was, Did Jesus have the moral ability to sin? A moral ability means that when you are bad enough, you can choose to sin. In each one of us, there is a moral ability, a moral capability, where we have enough badness or enough iniquity where we will then eventually choose and fall into sin. Well, Jesus, on the other hand, did not possess such badness. He didn't have any sinful desires like we do. The effect of sin upon us is not just in our committing of sin, but all that precedes it, and that is in our desires for it. Jesus had no desire whatsoever for sin. Jesus is God, and as James 1.13 says, God cannot be tempted with evil. And so theologians in the past have held to this view and designated this phrase, it says, uh, non posse picari, which means not able to sin. Jesus was a man who was not able to sin. 
And Scripture attests to this. Titus 1-2 says that God who cannot lie, citing Numbers 23, verse 19. Furthermore, since Christ is immutable, that means that in one day, He's not going to lie, and then another day, He will lie. He will not be tempted one day, and then another day, He won't be tempted. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot one day be attracted to sin, and another day be attracted to sin. That's why Jesus said in John 14, verse 30, the ruler of this world has no claim on me. Which the NAS more emphatically says, the ruler of this world has nothing in me. There is no compelling desire that this world can offer me that would tempt me to sin. I have no internal desire to pursue sin at all. So if Jesus was not able to sin, how could then the temptations be real? How could the temptations be real? How can Jesus say he was tempted if he in himself could not sin at all? Were the temptations just simulations like in the Matrix? Were they just fake temptations? Well, one real example that we could look at is in the wilderness when Jesus was tempted by Satan. And if you remember, Jesus was tempted. It says in the text that he was tempted to turn the stone into bread. To turn the stone into bread. Now, he could have easily done that. In fact, right after this episode, he did turn water into wine. So, what was the temptation for Jesus? What was the temptation? The temptation for Jesus was this. The temptation was for him to bypass his human nature in dependence to God and bypass that and rely on his divine nature to perform the miracle. Had Jesus given into this, he would no longer be what Hebrews 4.15 says of him, the one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. I take that to mean that Jesus had to be tempted like us in every way which caused him to rely only upon his human nature, just as we rely only on our nature, the only nature that we have. His divine nature could not be tempted, and so James 1.13 says he cannot be tempted in his divine nature, but was tempted in his human nature. He had to rely in every way possible, like us in our human nature, to resist that temptation. And therefore, the temptations of Jesus were indeed real. Now, how do we understand? How is it that it's real, and yet Jesus, being pure, could not succumb to such temptation? Well, imagine if you have a pure bar of gold, and you were to put that bar of gold in a crucible, and it's pure gold now. And if you were to increase the temperature of that crucible to the point where that gold will now start to melt, no dross would come up because it's pure gold. Let's say you increase the temperature even hotter and hotter and hotter. The gold remains pure. The gold remains pure. And here's the illustration. The purity of the gold does not make the heat of the flame any less hot. In like manner, the purity of Christ does not make his temptations any less real. In fact, he knows temptations far more than we do because he endured to the end without sinning. He knows temptations far more than you and I will ever know temptation. We fall into temptation. We fall into temptation with just a drop of temptation. Whereas Jesus, you could pour a bucket full of temptation upon him, and he would not buckle under its weight. Jesus knew no sin. He lived a pure life, a righteous and pure life. But if there was anyone that knows how strong temptation was, it would be him. He knows how much and how powerful temptation is because for us, we buckle so early whereas Jesus would endure and endure and endure and endure. How far would He endure? Endure to the point of death. Endure to the point of death. That's why we can go to Him. And He understands our temptations as the very next verse of Hebrews says, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. This is the purity of Christ. This is the Christ who is absolutely sublime, pure, undefiled. He is the one who knew no sin. He is the, this is the purity of Christ. Now let's look at the substitution by Christ. And this is where the passage really takes a turn. Turn. 
the substitution by Christ. In the next section, Jesus is, is described as the one who knew no sin. He is the pure one. He is the pure one. And then it says that He was made sin on our behalf. Or as the ESV puts it, for our sake, in the front, for our sake. That is an, as unbelievable, that is an unbelievable statement. It is literally saying, God made him sin. Do you feel the offense of that statement that God would make Christ sin? After all the time we've just spent saying that he is no, there's no sin in him. He is pure, he's undefiled. And here you hear not a man calling him sin, but God. God making him sin. God is the one that making making Christ sin. Now what does it mean that God the Father would make him sin? We begin by saying, by first saying what it doesn't mean lest we fall into heresy. First, it does not mean that Jesus was made a sinner on the cross. That's not what it means. We've already made the point that he, is, he could not have sinned. He has not sinned at any point in his life. Furthermore, the previous statement protects this. He says, he who knew no sin, he couldn't have been corrupt in his character. Because he just said he knew no sin. He couldn't, be, he couldn't be corrupt in his nature to become guilty of sin because of his moral ineptitude. And this needs to be said because there are some preachers who are very fast and loose in their preaching and they're very nonchalant saying, Jesus became a sinner on the cross for you. That is not true. Jesus did not become a sinner on the cross for you. Hebrews 7.26 that he is the Holy One the innocent one, the undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. The cross did not change the moral character of Jesus. He was not in any way transformed from blameless Lamb of God to the wicked, sinful sinner. No, He was the sinless substitute who died without blemish and without spot. Well, some would say, well, this, we need to change it and they need to modify it to remove the sharp offense of it. And they'll say, well, Jesus was, he made him a sin offering. Maybe that's what it means. Jesus was made a sin offering. So maybe Paul is going back into his Hebrew mind and saying, well, what this really means is Jesus was made into a sin offering, taking the tone of Leviticus 16 or something like that, or the, the promise of, of forgiveness by the sacrifice of an animal. So that's maybe what it might mean. That might make sense theologically that Christ is a sin offering, but grammatically, it can't make any sense at all. The sentence would not make any sense if the, the meaning of that Jesus was made sin was that Jesus was made into a sin offering because you can't have the same word, sin, in the same ten sentence and have it change meaning. Otherwise, it would sound like this. He made him who knew no sin offering to be a sin offering on our behalf. It cannot mean that. See how theologians are struggling with this? Because they can't find how offensive this sounds. So they try to remove the barb of that he becomes sin. It, it rattles the mind. It rattles the mind. So if it doesn't mean that Jesus was a sinner, if it doesn't mean that Jesus was a sin offering, then what does it mean that he was made sin? Well, it means exactly what it says. He was made sin. But how? If Christ's moral character is unchanged, if he doesn't become morally corrupt, what changed? If his moral status was unchanged and untarnished, and yet God makes him sin, the only answer then is that not his moral status changed, but his legal status changed. He receives the sin of others by imputation. Therefore, he becomes guilty, deserving the wrath of God. This is what was prophesied back in Isaiah 53. And if you turn there, it would be helpful for us to see this. Isaiah 53. Look at Isaiah 53. This is the prophecy that was fulfilled going back to Isaiah chapter 53, 700 years prior to this event. Isaiah 53 says this, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The iniquity of us all, that, that verb, that Hebrew verb, to lay on, 
was a violent word that speaks to fall on. The word is used in 1 Kings 2.25 describing Solomon's order to execute men who have been loyal. So it says in, uh, in verse 25, So King Solomon gave orders to Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and he struck down Adonijah. The idea is to, stri- to strike. The Lord strikes down this suffering servant with our iniquities. The intended meaning of the word is to strike down with violence, to lay upon him the sins, all our sins, to strike him down. MacArthur offers these words, these sobering words. He says we must remember that sin did not kill Jesus. God did. The suffering servant's death was nothing less than a punishment administered by God for sins others had committed. End quote. You see, dear friends, our all our sin, with all its guilt and shame, was imputed or charged unto Christ as if it belonged to Him. Even though He Himself was guiltless and holy. Go back to Isaiah 53 verse 4 and just count the number of prepositions. He says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore and carried our sorrows. And in verse 35, He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His wounds we are healed. Over and over, Him for us. Him for us. By His death for us. By His chastening for us. By His suffering for us. Penal substitutionary atonement is what is in view. The only conclusion that we can have when God says that He was made sin, the only conclusion that we can have is that Christ became sin legally, not morally. He was charged with the sins that he did not commit. He was charged with the sins committed by others. It was not by moral imputation. It was by legal imputation. Because the character of Christ remains spotless, remains blameless. The only thing that changed of him was his legal status in the eyes of God. He becomes guilty. And this is very important to see that morally he remains the same. Legally, his status changes. That's very important. He becomes legally cursed by God. He legally becomes sinful in the eyes of God because he takes on the sins that he does not commit but the sins of others. He he becomes a curse. That's why Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. The language of substitution is there. He became a curse for us. You know, I I can't even for a few minutes stomach sometimes the news that I read or watch in my news feed behind my computer. In the morning I, I I, I sift through the news. It's my daily habit. And there are times that I read about articles about laws that are being passed. And, I, and because we do live in the digital age, everything is recorded. Everything is recorded. Never has there been a time in history when so much video and so much uh, sensory experience is just overloaded. The videos of children in schools being beat up, being mobbed, Children of police officers being disrespected, teachers being disrespected, teachers being beaten up by students, mobs uh, beating up on people, doctors who I read about are mutilating our children because of the transgender movement, and now videos and pictures of these children showing off how they have been now changed. It's overwhelming to my sensibilities, and I can't even look at them. I can't, I can't spend a few minutes and I just have to scroll on past it or I have to move on and get to my job and just ignore all of that because I can't handle it. I'm a finite creature. That's just a few minutes of me looking through all that stuff. That's just a few minutes of my morning looking through that. Imagine looking through a lifetime of all the filth of one person, of just one sinner, looking through all the things that they have committed over and over again, you see the trail of receipts of all the sins that they have committed. You multiply that by all the people in the world 
all the people in the world, not just in this generation, but in previous generations, and also in the generations to come. And all the sins of those people. If I can't even look at it for a few minutes, how could God, the Holy God, look upon Christ, upon whom all the sins and all the iniquities and all the perversions, all the fornications, all the perversities that take place, He places it on His Son. That He would take it on and die a death that He did not deserve. Why would the holy, undefiled, innocent Lamb do that? Why would God perform this unthinkable act to place it upon His only and one and only Son, the one that He loves? Why would He do that? Well, the answer is given in just two words. Two words. Greek words. He says He did this for us. He did this for us. Now change that. Remove us. Now ask yourself, He did this not for us. Change it and say this. He did this for me. He did this for me. Dear Christian, I can say this to you on good authority. God placed more sins on Christ than you could ever count. And therefore, God loves you more than you will ever know. God loves you more than you will ever know because He's placed upon you more sins than you could ever count. Oh, Jesus paid for sins that He did not commit. And He did it for you and for me. This is the sinless substitute who takes our place on the cross. But we must finish our verse. We not only look to the one who is pure, not only to the one who is our substitute, but we must also now look to Christ, our justification. The last phrase in this passage reads this way. He says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Why? Here's the reason. That we might become the righteousness of God In Him. Just as Christ becomes sin, we become the righteousness of God. Just as Christ becomes a curse for us, we become blessed of God. Again, we have to be very careful with the text. It doesn't say that we might be transformed into righteousness. It doesn't mean that God transforms us to be righteous. Nor does it say that God makes us righteous. We have to maintain the meaning that Paul has here. That just as Christ was not made more, more, more sinful, it doesn't mean just as Christ was not made more sinful, we are not made more moral. We are not made more righteous. Just as the moral status of Christ did not change, only his legal status changed, so also our moral status did not change, only our legal status changed. Notice it doesn't say that we become righteous. Instead, we might become the righteousness of God. It's very deliberate. This righteousness is not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of God. The genitive tells us it's a righteousness that belongs to someone else. It belongs to God. Who imputes this to our account. There are two parties in this exchange. Us and Christ. Our sins were placed on Christ. And Christ's righteousness was placed on us. Both parties preserve their moral status. The only change is both parties change in their legal status. Christ becomes sin while morally perfectly holy. We become righteous while morally still remaining sinful. Do you understand that? We remain sinful when God declares us just. You see this. You experience this. You hear this in testimonies over and over again. On Sunday nights, when we have baptisms, how many times have you heard people say, when I got saved, I did not get zapped, as if all of a sudden my sins stopped happening. I was still a sinner. God did not zap me. But I know that I'm free. Morally, they remained sinful. But legally, they became just and righteous. This passage is what led Luther to maintain his famous phrase, 
Simon Eustace et peccator, which means a sinner and just at the same time. That's what it means to be justified. You are a sinner and you are just at the same time. Because a person is declared legally righteous by God while at the same time morally sinful. God declares sinners righteous legally while morally they remain sinful. And the Roman Catholic Church did not agree with this legal imputation view that Luther discovered. They called this view a legal fiction. They declared that justification, Rome did, they declared that justification is not a change in legal status, but a change in moral status. They hold that you are justified by the sacraments, beginning with infant baptism, then more sacraments, and a life of penance and obedience to God, so that in the end, in that final day, you'll be declared justified by God. They do not believe or hold to the doctrine of justification by an imputed righteousness that is placed on our account. Rome, they believe in a type of analytical justification. An analytical justification where God will justify a sinner only under His divine inspection where the sinner has performed enough righteousness, where the sinner has performed enough obedience, where God then at one point, at some point, we don't know when, that God will then declare him justified. In other words, the ground of a person's justification, according to Rome, is by their own righteousness that is infused by God's righteousness. They believe in the grace of God, just as we believe in the grace of God. But this is where the rubber meets the road. They believe in a grace that is given to the sinner, but that sinner takes the grace of God and infuses it with their righteousness so that instead of an imputed righteousness, they receive an infused righteousness so that they have some credit in the justifying process because of some good that they committed, some moral good that they contributed to their merit before God. They see it as an infusion of righteousness, not an imputation of righteousness. They believe that in order for you to be justified, it's not about legality. It's about morally. You must morally be changed. You must morally be cleaned up. How are you cleaned up? Sacraments. How are you cleaned up? The church. How are you cleaned up? Authority of the church, the popes, the councils, and the magisterium. And so the reformer said, I don't see that in the scriptures. I don't see that in the scriptures. One example is in the Gospel of Luke. Look at how Jesus addresses this. Go to Luke chapter 18. This is a story that really, I think, highlights the issue that is at hand. The very heart of the Gospel is about this righteousness that is at, at stake here. Luke chapter 18 where Jesus tells a story of the rich man, the Pharisee and the publican, I'm sorry, the Pharisee and the publican. And notice how the story begins in verse 9. In verse 9, he says this, And he also told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So Jesus knows his audience. He's addressing people who are so full of their what? Righteousness. Who trusted in themselves. This is who Jesus was really picking a fight with all the time. And then he says this parable. He says, Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself. Notice the posture of the Pharisee. He, he stood and was praying thus to himself. God, I thank thee that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. In fact, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes and all that I get. You can put that and say, I, I go to church every week. I, I have done such and such. I have been baptized as an infant. I have done all these things. I have attended these ceremonies. I have attended and performed these rituals. I have given my money twice a week. Then in verse 13, Notice the contrast of this type of person who is so dependent on their own righteousness, so dependent on, all, on their own merits, on their own activity, on their own performance. Look at verse 13. 
He says, but in contrast to that man, look at another man. There's this tax grad, tax gatherer. And notice where he is located. Standing some distance away. He can't even come near the temple. He wants to go to the temple, but he can't come in because of this despair that he feels within himself. It says this, but the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. You see, his posture was altogether different. This posture was one of brokenness, beating his breast, saying, God, I've done nothing. God, I offer nothing. God, I've contributed nothing. God, I just ask you, do one thing that only you can do. Be merciful to me, the sinner. Notice it doesn't say, be merciful to me, a sinner. He says, be merciful to me, the sinner. I know what I've really done. I am a sinner. I've stolen. I've swindled. I've taken people's money. I know that I am a sinner. Be merciful to me. That, dear friends, is the cry of a humble, broken faith of a man. This is God's design and justification. It's really to humble us. It's designed by God, this justifying work of Christ. It's meant to humble us, to break us, to, as one man would put it, abase us. As Pastor Steve Fernandez wrote in his book, everything about the Gospel is designed to glorify Christ and abase man. Therefore, anything that diminishes Christ's glory is either directly or indirectly inconsistent with the Gospel. Justification by faith rightly abases man and duly exalts Christ. And so Jesus concludes this story in verse 14. Notice what Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the man who was broken, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Fernandez is right. Justification exalts Christ and abases. That's an old Puritan word that means humbles man. That's what it does. It shows that God has done everything. I have done nothing. He's done it all. I have contributed nothing. And it is no wonder, dear friends, that the doctrine of justification has always been under attack. It's always been under attack again and again in every point in church history. Again and again. Satan wants to rob Christ of glory. Satan wants to rob Christ of all credit. Satan wants to rob Christ of his righteousness. And he wants to give Christians... This temptation in their ear, you must do a little bit of something on your part. You must perform a little bit of commitment on your part. Show God a little something on your part to show that He can actually save you. Take a step forward and maybe then God will take the other steps for you. But no, justification is a declaration that Christ has done it. Christ has done it all and so it humbles us. It humbles us. Justification is two parts. One part is about what Christ did in His death, but another part about what He did in His righteous works of merit that He receives and achieves for us. Justification is about the positive merits that we receive. The death of Christ forgives us of all our sins. That's one part. But there's another part also in justification that is the righteousness that He achieves. And this is very important because when, just, when people talk about justification, they only talk about forgiveness of sins. Let me say this. The forgiveness of your sins is not what gets you into heaven. The forgiveness of sins is not what gets you into heaven. It wipes away all your sins, yes. It gives you a clean slate, yes. But you need something more than a clean slate to get to heaven. You need righteousness to get to heaven. You need righteousness to get to heaven. It's what Psalm 15 verse 1 says. The psalmist asked, Lord, who may abide in your tent? Or who may dwell in your holy hill? In verse 2, the answer is given. He who walks with integrity and works 
righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Again, in Psalm 24, verse 3, the same question is asked, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? Again, the answer is given in verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart was not lifted up his soul to an idol nor, sw- nor sworn deceitfully. For God's people to stand fully accepted in his presence, it requires more than a forgiveness. It requires more than a clean slate. We need to possess a perfect righteousness, a perfect record of perfect conformity to the nature and will of God. This is why, dear friends, we preach not just the death of Christ, we preach also the life of Christ. Jesus came to this earth and lived a life that was full. He lived a life of 33 years. 33 years on this earth And what was he doing in those 33 years of his life? He was obeying the law of God. He was obeying and performing every righteous deed before God. He was like us in every respect. A man under the fallen world, under authorities above him, and he honored all authorities above him. He was tempted in all ways, just like you and I were tempted. We complain a lot about our governor. He had a worse governor than what we have. And yet he submitted himself lived perfectly. He achieved righteousness for us in those 33 years of His life. That's why we need to mention not just His death, but also His life. I thought about this a lot. What does it mean that Jesus achieves a righteousness for us? Have you ever wondered when Jesus was on the Jordan River And he was about to be baptized. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. He goes to his cousin, John the Baptist, and he says to him, will you baptize me? And John the Baptist says, first of all, it must have been very awkward for him to say, I baptize you. It should be you who should baptize me. You need to ask the question, why does Jesus have to be baptized, first of all? And first of all, why be baptized into the baptism of John? Because John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Repentance from what? Sin. Now, Jesus didn't commit any sin. So why did he have to be baptized? Why did Jesus have to be baptized? And, and so it says, let me turn to the text. He says this, he came to John to be baptized, but John tried to prevent him. He tried to prevent him. But Jesus would insist. Jesus answered, said to him, permit it at this time, for in this way... It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It was fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. You see, what Jesus was doing is He was fulfilling all righteousness. Now I'm asking myself, wait a minute. He's already righteous. Jesus is already righteous. He's already perfect and holy. Why does He have to obey and obey and obey, even in obeying in baptism, why does he have to attain righteousness if he's already righteous? The answer is because he's attaining a righteousness not for himself. He's attaining a righteousness for us. And the only way he can attain a righteousness for us is he had to be like us. He had to be like us in every way, like us, tempted like us, and always under the law, like us in every way, so that he would achieve a righteousness, the same playing field, if you could put it that way. Because if you were to say, he puts God's righteousness into us, that wouldn't be any fair, because that's his divine righteousness. So God says, let me show you my son, who is going to live in the same world as you, who is going to be under the same rule as you, who is going to be under the same elements as you. And my son will achieve for you what you could not do. And that is achieve a righteousness for you. He will submit himself. He will submit himself to the authorities. He will submit himself to this world, to the elements of this world. He will tire like you get tired. He will hunger like you are hungry. He will bleed like you will bleed. And he will do this all in obedience to the law to achieve a righteousness, not for his own sake, but for our sake. To obey the law that only he could completely obey. You stop and think about it. In the Genesis account, 
We just went through this in our Sunday school in the Genesis account. After the creation of Adam, he had but a few moments. And God just really gave Adam one law. Of all the trees you can eat, of all anything you can have except this one tree, this, this one tree, don't eat from this. He was just given one law. Just one law. And in a perfect world, and he broke that one law. You think of Christ. He was given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of law and in a place in an imperfect world, in an imperfect garden. He obeyed them all perfectly. Why did he do that? I ask, ask this question to unbelievers. I ask this question to, to Mormons. I ask this question to Catholics. Why did Jesus live a perfect life? What was the point of him living a perfect life? Well, they would say, well, to be an example. So we have someone to follow. So, so that because he's a good teacher, he would be a bad teacher if he didn't have a good example. Well, there's certainly elements to that of why he lived a perfect life. No, that, the ultimate answer of why he lived a perfect life was because he lived a life of righteousness so that he could take that righteousness and impute it to our account. He accomplished what the first Adam could not do that the last Adam, Christ, did. By perfect obedience. Listen to Romans 5 verse 19. For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. It was by his obedience that we are righteous. Elsewhere, we see Paul's admonishment to the Philippians. After Paul gives his spiritual resume, telling them that he is, if anyone is able to give themselves confidence in the flesh, if there's anyone that is righteous in their own doing it is me he says i far more than all i was circumcised the eighth day that phrase circumcised the eighth day that is not a boast about himself that's a boast about my parents my parents did the right thing i was raised in the right home they circumcised me on the eighth day that's a that's a flex about how great his parents was not about himself i was raised right i was of the nation of israel i was born right i was of the tribe of benjamin i was in the right line I was a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee. I'm better than you in all these ways. I do life better than you. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness, which is the law, found blameless. That's Paul. But then he says this. He says this. But in light of all that God demands, even though after all that, he says, I count it all as dung, as rubbish, as scubalon. In verse 9, he says that I may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that is derived from the law, but that which is through faith. It's not me. People struggle all the time. What do I have to do to be saved? You don't do anything. It's not up to your works. It's not up to your own merits. It's not up to your righteousness achieving it for yourself. It's not up to you. If it were up to you, then why did Christ come? You see, he came to obey the law that you could not obey. He came to be the curse that you should have been. And so his work, 2,000 years ago, for 33 years, he lived this perfect and righteous life. How then, you must ask yourself, how then do I get that? How then do I get that righteousness? If I can't do it on my own, if I can't, do all the rituals of my own, how can I get that from 2,000 years ago? How do I get that? What Paul says, the righteousness which comes from God through faith. That's it? I just believe? I believe that's all I have to do? That's all you have to do. That's too hard to believe. Exactly, that's the point. It's the point is it's so unbelievable that it seems like it's, it's a fake news. But really, it's good news. Because you've done nothing and Christ has done everything. That's why it's good news. Faith is how we attain this righteousness. We believe what Jesus has done in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. We believe that salvation is by good works. Salvation is by good works. It's just not by your works. It's by Christ's works. It's his work that saves you, not your work. Because your work, your work could never achieve righteousness. We need the righteousness of another. And how will this impact a person? Imagine for a moment that you had that tax collector that went up to the temple. And you had a little interview with him. Imagine he had a podcast and he, he was sitting across from you. What, what question would you ask him about that story that Jesus told? 
What would you say to him? I, I, I would probably ask him this question. What did it, what did you feel when Jesus said to you, you're now justified? What did you think about that when Jesus said that to you? I wonder if the tax collector would say this. I, I can't believe he would say that. I can't believe he would say that I'm justified because I have stolen so much money. I haven't even repented yet. I haven't even given my money back to the people that I've stolen. I haven't even uh, gone back and asked for the forgiveness of all the people that I have ripped off. I haven't even done any of that. And for him to, de- to declare to me that I'm justified, how can that be? That God would justify me a sinner. I haven't even gone to church yet. I haven't even done anything on my own. And God would declare me righteous? And I think the reason he could declare me righteous is because he realizes, because I realize that there's nothing that I can do. All I did was cry out for mercy. All I did was cry out for help. Oh God, help me, the sinner. That's why I'm, I believe that is why it is good news. It's a celebration of what God has done and, a, and it's a celebration of, I, of what I could not do. Oh, Christian, do not forget that Jesus not only paid it all, Jesus accomplished it all. Jesus didn't just die for our sins, but he also had to live for our righteousness. Justification is not just a declaration by God that says that you are not guilty. Many people erroneously say justification is a declaration that you are not guilty. That's not justification. Justification is a, is a declaration But the declaration is this, you are righteous. You are righteous. That's amazing love. Oh dear saints, praise the Lord that the gospel is so powerful that any eclipse of its glory is only momentary. In Geneva, Switzerland, there is a wall known as the Reformation Wall. And in this wall, there are these monuments, these statues of the reformers, William William Farrell, John Calvin, Theodore Beza, and John Knox. And in large letters... Above that wall, there's this Latin phrase, post tenabras lux, which translated means after darkness light. When the Roman Catholic Church hid the gospel by defying the clear teaching of Scripture that justification is by faith alone, by the imputed righteousness of Christ alone, the gospel was eclipsed. But God in His mercy allowed for light to shine in small pockets throughout history. But in, but in the Reformation, the eclipse ended while the bursting forth of light came forth as the gospel was recovered once again. In 2008, Chris Anderson wrote a hymn entitled, His Robes for Mine. And verse 2 explains most fully that great exchange that took place for our justification. It, it reads this way. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand with righteous works not mine, saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. Oh dear friends, this is the heart of the gospel. We stand on sacred ground because we stand on the righteous works not mine. We are saved by by our Lord's vicarious death and life. Let me pray. Oh Father, Would you bring our joy and anchor it in what Christ has done for us? The great enemy to this is we at times want to work and work and work for our own salvation or maybe our own pleasing of you. And as a result, we fall into a a mind of legalism and we, we we fall into despair because we've not done enough. Or we might become so free in our justification that we feel like we don't ever have to obey the law. Oh God, help us to remain in your center. That is, by Christ's righteous life that we are justified by what He has done, by what He has accomplished. And because of what He accomplished, we want to follow Him. We want to obey Him. We want to love Him out of a heart that is full of gratitude. That's why I stand here this morning as with the Apostle Paul, pleading for sinners this morning, I plead with you, be reconciled to God. 
Oh, save someone this morning by a righteousness not their own, but by Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand?